Um, so what I wanted to do today is give you an overview of frontotemporal dementia and also talk a bit about progression and also what potential treatments are coming up in the future because I think that's what everyone's interested in. Um, please stop me as we go if you've got any questions because I'd rather it be interactive than everyone sit there and say um, at the end we didn't understand or didn't get anything from the talk. So what I've done is tried to answer questions that I get most commonly asked in the <coughs> clinic. So the first question that people ask is what is neurodegeneration, what is dementia and then everyone's heard of Alzheimer's disease but not many people have heard of frontotemporal dementia. So we use the term neurodegeneration as really an overarching term. So those are conditions where the brain degenerates um, because of a deposition of a protein. We don't exactly know what causes this deposition of these different proteins. And then we have an overarching term of dementia where people develop cognitive decline. And within that, there are different diagnoses. So everyone's heard of Alzheimer's disease where people predominantly present with changes in memory. They might often get lost going to places that they would normally know the way to. Then we've got frontotemporal dementia. Then we've got other conditions such as ALS or motor neurone disease, and then Parkinsonian plus conditions. What we know from clinical practice is as diseases progress, all of these conditions can overlap. So if you've got a primary diagnosis of FTD, for example, as a disease progresses, you might develop signs of Parkinsonism, so slowing of walking, um, a shuffling gait and that doesn't mean that the doctor's got it wrong and you've actually got Parkinson's disease. What it means is all of these conditions can overlap because the protein spreads throughout the brain and as different parts of the brain become involved you develop different symptoms. So when we talk about frontotemporal dementia we know that there are three basic subtypes. So the most common form is what we call behavioural variant frontotemporal dementia. And this is where patients present predominantly with behavioural changes. So it's um, lack of empathy, um, lack of initiation, decreased motivation. Some patients can present with inappropriate behaviour, so approaching strangers that they wouldn't normally talk to. They can also develop a quite prominent sweet preference um, and a preference for carbohydrates. The second type that we talk about is a language form of frontotemporal dementia called semantic dementia. And this is where patients um, lose the ability to know the meaning of words and objects. So these are patients, for example, that the wife might say to them, can you get me a tomato from the fridge? And they'll say, what's a tomato? Or they might say, can you get me my credit card? And they'll say, what's a credit card? And often their speech is normal, and initially their behaviour can be normal, but as the disease progresses, they can become much more rigid and often look similar to the patients with behavioural variant FTD. The last type of um, FTD that we talk about is progressive non-fluent aphasia. And these are patients who present um, with problems with their speech. So it can often initially sound like a stutter. And I've seen patients that have been misdiagnosed as having a stutter onset in their 50s, which sounds a bit, um, it shouldn't happen. So that's why they've probably been misdiagnosed. But essentially, the patients can start off with a stutter, and then their speech loses grammar. They have problems in producing their speech and their speech becomes non-fluent. And often as the disease progresses, they can get subtle behavioural changes as well. So does anyone have any questions at that point? Yeah. Many of these um, symptoms present early in someone's life or are they predominantly in older age? Yeah, I mean, so that's a really interesting question. We think that there is what we call a prodromal period. Um, so patients can develop symptoms for kind of 10 to 15 years kind of prior to diagnosis, just subtle changes and then something happens that then there's a much more kind of rapid <coughs> onset of behavioural changes. And I have seen patients, for example, that people have said, oh, they've always been not quite right or a bit funny and now suddenly they've got a diagnosis. So I think there is something that's going on that we haven't been able to find. Any other questions? Yeah. 
the problem with word finding is it's a very broad term and patients, for example, with Alzheimer's disease have word finding difficulties. So I think all of them can have word finding difficulties because the whole kind of frontal system of the brain controls our concentration, our executive function. So if you're not kind of concentrating and able to kind of organize, you will also have kind of word finding difficulties. So we kind of tend clinically, a lot of patients describe word finding difficulties. The other thing is a lot of people describe memory problems as well, because it's kind of a term that everyone uses. So for example, we've got patients with semantic dementia who the carer will come in and say their memory's gone to shot. I don't know what's going on, but it's not really a memory problem. It's because they don't know the words for things that they're asking for. So people think it's, they've got a loss of memory. Any other? Yeah. Yeah, and that can also happen. So as each of these diseases progress, they can merge into one. So often patients with behavioural variant, as a disease progresses, will lose their semantic knowledge, so their meaning of words and objects as well. And then as each of these diseases progresses, the brain shuts down, essentially. And that's why people, as they progress, may start with behavioural changes, but then lose the ability to speak, lose the ability to interact by the different patterns of brain shrinkage. So this is a patient um, with semantic dementia where the patients lose the meaning of words and objects. And that's got a classical MRI finding, which is shrinkage of the anterior temporal lobe. So this is the temporal lobe of the brain. And that very much controls um, your language and your ability to know what words mean. Does that make sense? to everyone. Um, with patients with progressive non-fluent aphasia, they um, tend to have atrophy affecting um, the gyrus, so the kind of area here of the brain. When we look at um, the pathology that's causing frontotemporal dementia, this is a brain specimen of a patient who donated their brain. And as we can see, there's similar shrinkage of the front part of the brain and the temporal lobes of the brain. We know that there are two um, key proteins that are deposited in the brain that cause frontotemporal dementia. And about 50% of patients have a protein called tau, and about 50% of patients have a protein called TDP43. Clinically, we can't usually tell the difference of what's deposited in the brain. Um, but there are new techniques coming in research that might help us. So we're looking at scans that might be able to help us know what proteins are deposited in the brain. I think that's really where the key for treatment will come. Once we know what kind of protein a person has, we could potentially target um, that protein in treatment. Um, so what I wanted to do now was talk to you about some other activities um, aspects of research that we've been doing in FTD. Um, so traditionally we've thought of frontotemporal dementia as just affecting cognition and behaviour, so just um, affecting how we interact with other people and how we think. But what we're learning more and more is that it does affect what we call the physiological aspects of our body, so our eating behaviour and metabolism, our autonomic control, so that's blood pressure control, our thermoregulation, also our sleep patterns, and also our motor function. So what we're finding is a lot of these changes occur before the patients become symptomatic with their cognitive and behavioural changes. So often patients may have changes, for example, in their thermoregulation for many years prior to diagnosis, and also in their eating behaviour and sleep patterns. So one of the aspects that I've particularly looked at is eating and frontotemporal dementia. And you'll know this better than I do. A lot of the patients develop changes in their eating behaviour. So some patients um, will become quite rigid in what they eat. Um, I've got one patient, for example, that will only eat um, fresh fruit. Another patient that will insist every time um, her husband drives past McDonald's, he has to stop to get the soft serve ice cream cones. Um, also people eating huge amounts of sugar, 
Um, I had one patient who put honey on all of their kind of roast vegetables. And <laughs> often, um, I had in I, I think Tammy, who she won't mind me saying, that um, her husband has made milkshakes with M&Ms and, yeah, so it's really kind of a common problem that you're dealing with um, every day. And I think a lot of people find it confusing about why are these people eating these funny foods? God, what's going on? And we did this experiment um, where we set up kind of a breakfast meal and just let the patients eat what they wanted to eat. And we compared um, patients' control subjects, Alzheimer's disease, patients with semantic dementia, and patients with BVFTD. And what we found was the patients with behavioural variant FTD ate almost double what the patients with the other forms of dementia ate and control subjects. And the semantic dementia patients were particularly rigid. Um, so a lot of them didn't like what the food was on offer. They're like, I don't eat that, I'm not eating that. Kind of, you can't make me eat it. Um, also what we found was both patients with BVFTD and semantic dementia had a strong um, preference for sugar. So we designed this experiment um, with eaten mess, which is a dessert, and we had three different types of sugar. And then we got them to try it and then left them to eat what they wanted and tell me how much they liked it. And the patients with BVFTD ate huge amounts of the one with 60% sugar, as did the semantic dementia patients, which wasn't present in control subjects and AD subjects. And what we know is that this doesn't, just isn't, I guess, a behavioural change. There's actually changes in the brain going on that are controlling this involving the hypothalamus, which is kind of a tiny structure, but it pulls a big punch and it can control your eating behaviour through changes in uh, different types of hormones. And what we know is that FTD can overlap with motor neurone disease. So about 10 to 15 percent of patients develop motor neurone disease and develop muscle weakness. And we think that's because there's a spread of pathology from the motor areas of the brain into the frontal part of the brain causing behavioural changes. And we know from motor neurone disease that there are changes in eating behaviour and metabolism. So a lot of patients, for example, with motor neurone disease, have an increased metabolic rate, changes in their lipid levels, become insulin resistant or diabetic, and develop abdominal fat deposition as well. And what we found is that these changes in eating behaviour, the increased carbohydrate, sweet preference, are present across both frontotemporal dementia and motor neurone disease. And a lot of people try to curtail what their um, partner or family member is eating, but what we found is actually those eating changes are beneficial. So if people have more abnormal eating behaviour, they have an improved survival. Um, and that seems counterintuitive because why kind of eating McDonald's all the time, ice cream, sugar, how could that be good for you? But the hypothesis is that the body with a neurodegenerative condition is increasing its metabolic rate, so it's working harder. So the patients are eating these high calorie foods to counteract that increased metabolic rate and maintain their body mass index and improve their survival. And recently we've done a study just in FTD patients where we looked for those body composition changes. So a number of you would have gone for DEXA scans, which essentially um, measures every kind of piece of fat on your body. It's not an enjoyable experience. Um, and essentially what we found um, in the FTD patients, the BVFTD, they have an increased um, android to gynoid ratio. So that's fat deposition around your midriff. Um, and also increased visceral um, fat deposition. So again, that's around your midriff. And the hypothesis is that that um, provides an extra source of energy for the body when it's in this kind of fight or flight neurodegenerative process. So the kind of take home message is that the eating behaviors um, shouldn't be controlled to the point of um, you know, cutting everything out. It's okay if they want to have increased fat um, and sugar to, I mean, I wouldn't say let them eat your whole house, for example, but letting them eat um, high calorie foods is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the next kind of thing I wanted to talk about is other functions of the hypothalamus, which I mentioned to you is that tiny structure. So the hypothalamus not only controls eating behavior, but also autonomic function. And this is a study we did a couple of years ago 
looking at changes in autonomic function, so blood pressure, um, thermoregulation, sweating patterns. And what we found is patients with both semantic dementia and behavioural variant have an increased incidence of autonomic changes. So patients will have changes in their thermoregulation. So we've got patients, for example, it can be 40 degrees outside and they're dressed in duffel coat, beanie, socks, or it's really hot in the house and you want to put the air conditioning on and they're like, no, 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 it's freezing or vice versa, it can be freezing cold and they're walking around in shirts and t-shirts. Um, the other thing that we know is that this autonomic function can affect your pain perception. So a lot of patients, they can go either way. One, they can have an increased um, incidence of pain perception. So they might have a little scratch and they become obsessed with that, that it's painful. Or for example, they might break their arm and be walking around for weeks not feeling pain. And that's potentially related to changes in your autonomic function and pain perception. The other interesting thing that kind of links in with autonomic function um, is sexual function. And this is a big um, area, I guess, for carers. And we had um, Cassandra Casey, who's our occupational therapist, and she sat with a number of carers and looked at where there changes in sexual function. And what we found was that patients, um, both with behavioural variant and semantic dementia, often had decreased interest in sexual function, were not affectionate, um, didn't initiate sexual relations with their partner. And it was a big, um, I guess, distress for the carer. And often it helps knowing that it's not the carer being rejected by the partner, it's actually part of the illness in terms of changes in autonomic function, but also changes um, in the ability to kind of recognise um, someone else's cues and how to respond to it. Um, we also think that these sexual changes are related to changes in the hypothalamus as well. Um, so, Mike, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think to, there's a break. So it's difficult to know when. What we would say is try to control it. We don't want people, for example, putting on 20, 30 kilos. So 10 to 15 kilos is OK. Um, and it's also, for example, with patients with MND, we just let them go. So that's kind of much more rapid than FTD. So that's the kind of area of research. How far do we let them go? So I don't have an exact answer for you. But I mean, I think I wouldn't go to the point where you're kind of taking everything out and you've got them losing weight, because losing weight's not a good idea. Yeah. Yes. So often patients can start, so for example, semantic dementia with a language presentation usually starts on the left side of the brain because that's where our kind of language centres are. Um, behavioural variant can initially be asymmetric, so one side more than the other, but as the disease progresses, both sides. Autistic, not the brain, people have half the brain, people have the brain, half the brain, the brain seems to want to rewire itself. Yeah. Why in this type of disease can't the brain rewire itself? Conversation something that's not effective. Yeah, I mean, I guess, for example, when patients, for example, have a stroke, for example, and something gets damaged, the brain can potentially rewire itself because it's one insult at a particular time and then they can relearn things to a degree. They'll never get back to the point they were. The problem with these neurodegenerative diseases is it's progressive. So even if you can, for example, rewire your brain, the insult is kind of continuing to progress. So there's you know, protein deposition, ongoing shrinkage. So that's why it's harder to rewire. I, Morella will put them up. Yes. Yes. Um. Yeah. Yeah. 
diabetes, I'm worried about the thought you're looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of a toss-up. So what I would say is a little bit of weight gain isn't necessarily bad. And um, as well, we don't want them to get diabetes. Um, so it's kind of a balance between the two. But I, the reason I say, you know, don't control the eating is we've got some people who put people on kind of big diets and they lose 20 kilos because that's the message we've got. That's really good to lose weight. Um, but once you've got neurodegenerative diseases, it's a different story. Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I think three, four kilos would be fine. Yeah. yeah. How do you manage it if somebody's actually got diabetes already? Yeah. Um, so the d if they've got diabetes, we speak to the endocrinologist and we say, of course, we should control the blood sugar levels, but we don't want people to kind of have really low blood sugar levels. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's kind of a balance working kind of with the endocrinologist to manage the sugars. Um, if they, they continue eating the sweets, gain weight, and then also at still continuing to eat the same way, and you notice not a rapid but a slower decrease in uh, weight, the weight is slowly coming down, is that a sign of another problem? Or is that normal? I mean, I think that's normal. So um, people, and that, points towards it, the, the metabolic rate is increased. So you need to give them more of that? Well, I, I, what I always say is don't, do your best to try and make them not lose weight, mm -hmm. so keep the weight stable, so whether that's giving them protein supplements, things like that. Um, there is some argument that high fat diet might be beneficial, and we're doing an experiment at the moment with chicken kuma, which has different kind of fat so maybe next year I can tell you the answer <laughs> about that. Um, it's quite fun to get to meet Chicken Kuma and eat in medicine. <laughs> what role does exercise play? Yeah. Um, so exercise is good for a number of things in terms of keeping people alert. But what we would say is, again, we don't want people exercising to the point where they're losing weight rapidly so any form of exercise is good so you know walking things like that but we've had a couple of people for example who've joined gyms and are kind of running marathons kind of several times a week and that's not good so it's all kind of a balance um, you mentioned that high fat diet may be Um, that's an area of controversy. Um, I think there's several aspects to that. A lot of people ask about statins in terms of cognition. I don't think there's any evidence that statins make cognition worse. Um, so we'll leave that to the side. In the terms of FTD and MND, if someone has MND, for example, and FTD, we immediately stop their statin because there are studies in motor neurone disease showing that a high cholesterol is better. The potential mechanism for that is that the process it gets quite complex, so I'll try and explain it, but the process of neurodegeneration attacks the lipid layers of the neurons. And so the hypothesis is that the more cholesterol you have, the imp less damage there will be to the neurons. Indeed. In FTD, um, what we say, so if someone's already on a statin, I tend to leave them on the statin. If, um, they're not on a statin and say the cardiologist rings me, I have a discussion with them and say, well, what's their risk of having a heart attack? Because you're saying statins lower your risk of having a heart attack over kind of a 20 year period. But unfortunately, the progression of FTD is that you probably won't make 20 years. And so it's about giving you the best survival at the moment. So it's kind of a discussion that you have with the cardiologist. Um, so um, people who have um, frontotemporal dementia, we always ask when they come for follow-up, have they developed any signs of weakness? So things we would be looking for is if they've noticed swallowing problems, weakness of their hands, dropping things, a foot drop where their leg becomes weak. Um, and we test that by doing what we call nerve conduction studies in EMG, and that's where we put a needle, it sounds worse than it is, but we put a needle in the muscle um, and then measure for um, what we call denervation, so that's the changes of motor neurone disease.
Any other questions? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so people with um, FTD can develop Parkinsonian features, so it's not uncommon as people progress with FTD to get Parkinsonian features, so that's kind of stiffness of their muscles, shuffling gait, tremor, and kind of weakness. Of, yeah, it's, diff it's different um, to the MND weakness, because MND we see kind of wasting of the muscles. Um, whereas in Parkinson's disease, we don't see any shrinkage of the muscles. And, and the um, medication of Parkinson's people? Yeah, that's a common question we get asked. So uh, people ask, if you say he's got Parkinsonism, and I was just asked this this morning, why don't you put him on Parkinson's disease medication, so dopamine? The problem with dopamine is that, A, it doesn't work particularly well for the Parkinsonism that we see in other neurodegenerative diseases that aren't Parkinson's disease. So patients may only see a slight benefit. The other problem is it makes a lot of the behavioral symptoms much worse. So it can make people much more inappropriate, um, can make them hallucinate, can make their cognition worse. So it's again a trade-off um, because if they're not gonna work very much, what's the point in putting them on it to make the behavior much worse? Brain disorders, people are recommending that you go on a very high protein, so people got epilepsy and what have you, diet. Does that mean tried at all with MND? No, I mean, it is, has been tried in MND um, for high protein. Um, I think the message that we're giving people now is high calorie with MND, but it hasn't been tried in FTD. And then restless legs, is that associated with any of the sort of sleep disorders that are associated with? Yeah, um, so patients can um, get restless leg changes and changes in sleep, so insomnia or sleeping much more often than they were previously as well. Um, the difficulty with restless legs, I don't want, there probably is an increased incidence in FTD, but I don't want everyone to think if they've got restless legs, that means they're <laughs> going to get FTD. That's definitely not the case. <laughs> Um, so restless legs is more kind of a clinical description of people describing when they're asleep at night, um, they feel this kind of restlessness in their legs and in order to kind of resolve it they have to move their legs so often they sit out of bed um, and kind of rub their legs and kind of move them to kind of settle down that restlessness. Um, the problem with restless legs is kind of there is an increased incidence of neurodegenerative diseases with it but just because you've got restless legs does not mean you're going to get one of these conditions. Um, so the last part that I wanted to talk about, have I gone over time? No, sorry, um, is <laughs> progression in frontotemporal dementia. And this is, again, probably the most common question that we get asked. Um, so if I have a diagnosis of FTD, how long do I have? Um, and the best kind of data we've got is a recent, we had a visiting fellow um, from Cambridge, she looked at this data last year and we looked at um, 75 cases of behavioural variant um, FTD and what we found was that the median survival was about 10 and a half years um, from disease onset and the median survival without dependence, so that means before so you don't have to go, for example, to a nursing home, was about 8.9 years. Um, but when you look at the graphs, it's with all kinds of statistics, there are variations. So some people can be much quicker and some people can be much longer. Um, so these are the survival curves um, for survival without dependence and not needing to go to a nursing home. And this is um, since symptom onset. So some people can go out, for example, to 16 years. And this is um, from diagnosis, which is about eight years. But with all of that, every what we say to patients is, how long is a piece of string? And every patient is different. 
Um, but that's kind of the ballpark figures. When we looked at what kind of things predicted your survival, essentially what we found was it was when they presented if they had a shorter disease duration. So if you can imagine if you're presenting um, early, it means that you've got a much more rapid course, course. so that would have a sh um, shorter disease duration. Also what we call poorer visuospatial function, so that's, um, for example, might manifest in, we get people to draw cubes and um, intersecting figure eights and clock faces, but in normal everyday life that might be, for example, um, difficulty judging distances. Um, also a higher burden of behavioural symptoms, so that's obvious if you've got kind of a more behavioural, you've probably got a more rapid disease course. Um, also an older age and increased atrophy in a particular area of the brain. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk quick, quickly on was what were treatment options. So I think the major thing that we've got at the moment is I guess awareness of the care of burden and how we can help carers manage the changes in personality and behaviour. Um, we know that, for example, patients with um, both BVFTD, semantic dementia and PNFA have a much higher care burden than, for example, patients with Alzheimer's disease. The exciting thing is that there are some treatments finally coming through. Um, so Olivia is going to... What we've got now is more symptomatic management. So we manage people with um, atypical antipsychotics to help kind of with the rigid behaviour, um, inappropriate behaviour, and also um, SSRI. So those are things like citalopram, Effexor. Um, Olivia's going to talk this afternoon about a new trial um, that he's running using oxytocin to see whether that manages. Is that for the carer or for the patient? <laughs> Um, that's for the patient um, to keep people, um, to help kind of keep calm, but yeah, modify behavioural changes. Um, some of you would have read on the internet, there's a trial in Melbourne um, using selenate um, to kind of see what, how that helps, particularly patients with behavioural variant. Um, Olivia and I have been meeting with the people in Melbourne and hopefully that will start in Sydney kind of middle of next year, maybe hopefully a bit earlier. The other thing that's on the horizon is um, genetic modification um, studies and those are for patients who have a particular genetic mutation using kind of gene therapy and there's a couple of trials that hopefully we might be starting early next year and I think that segues into Clement who I saw at the door who's going to talk about the genetic aspects of FTD.